Hi, welcome to Get Lit. My name is Pete Crooks. I'm senior editor and senior writer at Diablo Magazine here in Walnut Creek. And on Get Lit, we meet up with local authors and writers at the Walnut Creek Public Library. Today, we are in for a real treat. We are with Scott Hutchins, whose first novel, A Working Theory of Love, has gotten great reviews. It's a fascinating uh, story, um, a very Bay Area story, and I'm very excited to welcome Scott to Get Lit. Thanks for having me, Pete. Uh, thanks for coming out to Walnut Creek. Now, um, tell us a bit about yourself. You're, are you San Francisco based? I am, yeah. I live, I live in the city, and, uh, and I work at Stanford. Okay. Now, did you grow up in the Bay Area? What, no, no. I'm originally from Arkansas. Okay. But I moved out here in the late 90s. And when did you start writing? Well, I started writing in college, okay. mostly. I thought I would be a science math person, uh, but I started writing, and I, this eternal challenge of it, I think, kind of inspired me to, to take it on as something that I'll do. And then I woke up one day and I was like, oh, I guess I'm, I guess I'm a writer. Yeah. But it wasn't, I didn't have a grand plan. Okay. I sort of you know, well, fell into it. And, and did you grew up in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. where, where, um, where did you do your undergraduate study? The University of Arkansas. Okay. Yeah, it was a Razorback. Okay. And what, uh, I, I'm, one thing we always like to talk with every writer is how libraries um, have affected your life, whether it was, uh, you know, the childhood local branch or, um, uh, um, maybe a, a library that you used to research your book or to um, the, the university library that, um, you know, that you have access to at a, a pretty good school over there on the uh, Yeah, the it's libraries, okay. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, how have libraries affected your, your well, life? Well, you know, uh, I know, this is a home, a home audience, I know, but I'm, this is, I'm, this, this, the truth is that libraries have been incredibly important to me over my life. Well, I, I grew up in a very small town, a town of about 5,000 people that didn't have a bookstore. So the only, our only source of books was the public library. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would go, I, my family and I went once a week. We'd put our books in, pull our books out. And uh, when I, I mostly read garbage, of course, but uh, you know, as I was getting older and decided that I wanted to become serious, I went to the classic section, which in our little library was two shelves over the exit. There was mm -hmm. the exit door and over it, there were two shelves of classics. And the things that made them the classics aren't necessarily actually classics, but. They were, you know, literature that was trying to reach beyond itself in a way that I hadn't read before. So I was able to find a lot of, um, I think, inspiration and things to challenge me at that little, at that little library, which um, meant a lot to me. And then when I went to first University of Arkansas, which has, you know, a, a, a good library, and then I did graduate work at Michigan and, and at Stanford, I, my libraries keep getting a little better I mm -hmm. think, as I go on. Uh, they have, they're really central to the way I write because I do, a, I'm a sort of research heavy writer. So I like to go into the library, find a book and then go to the section where that book is located and look at all the other books around it that are, you know, of a similar topic yeah. and see which ones I want to pull out. And so I spend, I spend quite a lot of time in those libraries and I, I use the San Francisco Public Library too. So I'm fond of it. And I also used to belong to a private library in San Francisco, the Mechanics Institute, okay. which uh, has been around for 150 years. And they have, they have had a subscription to the Atlantic Monthly that they've never canceled. And so they still have the actual Atlantic Monthlies in the basement that have, will say have a section of a novel from Henry James and a section of a novel from Mark Twain that wow. were published in there. So you can ask them and they'll get them for you. So anyway, and those, the short answer is a lot. And would those James and, and Twain, those would have been excerpts of uh, new pieces that were like... Yeah, and the, the first they published serially, both of them. Right, so you know. that would have been the first chance a reader would have had to... Mm -hmm. oh, that's and they were changed notably. You, know, you, you can buy now, there's actually an edition of Turn of the Screw, the James short story, the ghost, sort of ghost story, that is published, it was published in Collier's magazine, and you can buy it now in the serial form, and it's very different than the form that we read when we read it as a book, because he revised it significantly when he was moving from the serial form to the final form. So Did you have a chance to draft. read through the entire serial? Yeah, yeah I have the little book, so I've read the whole thing. Yeah. So yeah, I teach it sometimes. That's a great story. I love the, the film adaptation, The Innocence, with Deborah Kerr. Oh, I've never seen it. Oh, it's a gorgeous, spooky haunted house movie. Hmm. Um, and uh, and the, the goal of those sort of otherworldly ghosts taking possess of, possession of this brother and sister, mm -hmm. uh, it's so malevolent, like mm -hmm. what their intentions are, that uh, it's, it's really, really quite terrifying, even though the film made in 1962 is a really elegant movie. Um, and actually, I believe uh, 
the screenplay was adapted by Truman Capote. Oh, really? Yeah, who um, we, should, we should mention because uh, he comes into your life um, at Stanford. He, yes. In a sense. Yes, he um, posthumously, obviously, um, paid for my fellowship at Stanford for a couple of years when I was a Stegner Fellow. I was the Truman Capote Fellow. Can, can you explain that fellowship and, and, and its history? Sure. Uh, you know, Wallace Stegner, great Western writer, great California writer, um, was a professor at Stanford. And after World War II, uh, there was a kind of flood of GIs coming back from the war, a little mm -hmm. older than the normal undergraduate, who wanted to tell their story, wanted to tell, you know, they had stories to tell from their experience in the war. And Stegner said, well, why don't we set up a little fellowship and see if we can help them out? And so he, that was the beginning. He didn't call it the Stegner Fellowship, but it was the fellowship that he began then. Um, I guess, you know, we're working on 70 years ago. Um, and it, over the years, it's grown. And now it's a, um, it is a, uh, a fellowship that has 10 fiction writers and 10 poets in it at all times. They accept five fiction writers and five poets every year. And I did it a few years ago, and now I'm a lecturer there. But um, the Stegner Fellowship is actually the most this is the most selective program on Stanford campus now. It's easier to get into the med school than it is the Stegner Fellowship. That's amazing. Yeah. So and uh, I was talking with another uh, author earlier today, and it, it is so difficult to, to be published as a fiction writer now, mm -hmm. as, an un, as a, as a first-time uh, novelist. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it, terribly challenging. The, the, those uh, publishing companies don't buy a lot of uh, first novels, and, and fiction is a, is a difficult um, uh, category to, to break into. Mm -hmm. So congratulations well, on, uh, yeah. on that. Tell us about, uh, about your book and, and its origins. Like, where did, this, where did the inspiration for this story come? Well, you know, I was, I was writing, I was sort of writing two books. Uh, I was writing a, a book that was sort of built of my observations of day-to-day -day life in, in San Francisco. I was trying to capture this very particular historical moment in San Francisco taking notes, observing, overhearing things, writing them down. Um, and that was the novel I sort of thought I was writing. But in, on the side, I had this side interest in artificial intelligence, which I think asks these really interesting philosophical questions, like what does it mean to be human? Who are we? What is, you know, do, can we transcend our bodies? Things like that. And I was just doing that on the side, then writing this, which I actually wasn't sure it was a novel. I was really writing it two pages at a time in little bits. And then at some point, I kind of wondered if they could go together and then that and it worked and I, I you know I at, at least in the writing I'm not you know you could be the judge if it worked in the actual novel but you know in the process it's it it seemed to be working and they were talking to each other in ways that I thought was fruitful so I um, I went with that and I wrote it this is a novel about a computer that I wrote longhand I did not write it on a computer and you know I wrote it in two page chunks as I said here and there no particular order and then I spent a lot of time, um, you know, putting it together and, and revising it. And, and when you say you write long, longhand, I remember uh, one of my favorite crime writers, Elmore Leonard, he always wrote everything with a uh, Mont Blanc uh, pen, wrote it all <laughs> longhand, and then somebody transcribed it. I remember the, um, the attorney, Scott Tarot, wrote a book called Presumed Innocent, mm -hmm. which I think it took him like 10 years, and he would just write Former on Former Stegner fellow. On his, is that, is that right? Tarot. He would write on his... Uh, train ride, um, you know, and it, he, that, that may have been his first novel, Presumed Innocent. It was a huge bestseller. So. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm curious about the experience. Like I, I, as long as I've been writing, I always do it on a laptop. Um, why longhand? And um, does that give you an opportunity to sort of open yourself creatively and, and maybe write in, in different places that uh, you, it wouldn't be convenient to have a computer? Yeah, I think that's... I think that's right. I mean, there are a few different answers to the question. I mean, one is I do. I think a piece of paper is still just a more creative space than a laptop. I, I forget who said this, but they somebody brought up the idea that the uh, metaphor for what you see on your screen is not a desktop; it's a filing cabinet. You know, really, we should be calling this our filing cabinet because you're kind of always reaching down in it to it to pull a file out. Mm -hmm. Whereas a piece of paper is really on the surface, and you can write and then make a note over here and do this and do that and do that. Um, so I do think there is something a tiny bit more creative about a little more open, flexible about a piece of paper. Um, but the reason I was writing longhand is because I was doing a lot of online teaching, and I was on doing email a lot, and so computer just sort of psychically meant work. Mm -hmm. I opened it up, and I was like, this is, I have to do these things, all these tasks. And, um, and so it wasn't the right space for me to, to be 
to be able to be creative and get out of that. So I just, I surprised myself by going back to longhand writing. I haven't always been a longhand writer. And I don't always do it. Sometimes I write um, with a computer. Mm -hmm. But I only do first draft. And then, that, then I type it in. And at that point, it's entirely um, down on computer. Yeah, easier to edit. A lot point. easier to edit. If you want to change a name, right. it's a lot faster. Do you um, still write, do you correspond longhand? Do you write letters and cards? Um, well, I, I try to write letters periodically, uh, but it really is mostly email at this point. So your story is set in, in um, the high-tech hub of the world, which is right here uh -huh. in the Bay Area. And it's such a fast, I mean, I, I'm a Bay Area native, so it's just kind of always been a part of our local culture. But it's, it's so interesting to look at the effect that technology that, was, that has originated here in the area has really changed the way the entire world mm -hmm. communicates. Um, and there's so many uh, interesting looks now at the culture of this Bay Area, you know, tech world. Mm -hmm. um, the HBO series Silicon Valley, I think, is just hilarious. Very funny. And I think that um, the show creator, Mike Judge, has a really sharp way at, at, at sort of observing and then satirizing uh -huh. um, uh, the high tech world, and then obviously the, the corporate world and office space 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so talk about sort of creating this fictional mm -hmm. landscape that's based on a, a very real, real world. Well, the, I mean, when I was writing this, when I started writing this, San Francisco wasn't yet a part of Silicon Valley. You know, the sort of, you know, Silicon Valley has since kind of, you know, taken the city to a certain extent. But that really wasn't the, the case when I was writing this book. And so it kind of goes between worlds. There's San Francisco where the character lives, and then he goes down to Menlo Park for work. Um, of course, I work at Stanford, so I'm down in the middle of all of this. And um, I just, again, the artificial intelligence part, which is just, you know, that's just a normal conversation in Silicon Valley. People are, I mean, Google considers itself a large artificial intelligence project at a certain level. So, um, I, I liked the idea that something that seems so sort of heady and philosophical is in fact just day-to-day -day business in a lot of these places that are around, around Stanford and that you know, Stanford has produced many of these. Um, but I also wanted just to talk about the culture, the culture of startups, the culture of you know, the work, the culture of these ideas that are business ideas but they don't really have a concrete thing at the end that I can recognize at mm -hmm. least. I think to me, that's a really interesting thing to talk about fictionally. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to explore that a little bit as well um, in the book. And your protagonist that takes us through that story, talk about that character's origins and, and how does he come to life as you're writing this down on, on the page? Um, you know, how long did it take you to write this book? Four or five years, depending okay. on when you start to you know, date it. So uh, that, that those original concepts that you started scribbling down before that gets you know into an editing phase, um, where did you see him? Like, how did you see him at first, and, and, and where did he take you as you as you wrote the book? Well, he he from a, a sort of technical skill background mirrors me. So he you know is not someone who has a tech background. So he doesn't have you know he's not coming in. He's not the person doing the actual uh, computer programming mm -hmm. behind what he's working on. Um, so he sort of stumbles into this tech world because he, um, he has a big stack of journals, which are his father's journals. His father committed suicide, but he, and after he committed suicide, they, it turned out they'd been keeping these incredibly uh, detailed journals. They called him the Samuel Peeps of the South. Uh, and so once the artificial intelligence programmer, uh, Laborno, who I was sort of melding a professor at Stanford named John McCarthy, who was actually more or less invented the term artificial intelligence, and also um, von Neumann. But when he f hears about these, he wants these for his Turing test project, and that's how he that's how he he contacts Neil, the main character, and that's how Neil comes into this startup world. And the the idea of artificial intelligence it, it has been used in science fiction literature for you know, well over a century, mm -hmm. but um, it, 
it's really starting to happen in, in our world now. I mean, I'm still a little freaked out by the idea of self-driving cars mm -hmm. and uh, well, it turns out a few of them have had accidents. Right, right. like the, it's got to happen, right? <laughs> like, the, just um, it, it, we're, it's a non-perfect world that we're living in, and there's people driving, you know, uh, human-operated cars, and that's not going to uh, just have a perfect fluidity with with self-driving cars. The other thing that always terrifies me: the idea of Amazon packages being delivered by, by drone. drone. Yeah. yeah, like that just can't <laughs> work perfectly. There's yeah. no way. Um, so, but, but something as, as, um, you know, basic as, as package delivery mm -hmm. can all of a sudden feel kind of ominous, you know, not, I mean, and if we want to talk about drones, they're certainly being used for far more ominous purposes than packages, like right. delivering, so delivering something for Amazon. Right. right. Um, they're delivering, you know, they could deliver a nuclear payload at some point. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, I, I'd love to just hear your thoughts on um, the idea of artificial intelligence as a, um, you know, as a, a fictional device, mm. and and how to explore those as an author, um, mm. those ideas. Well, the artificial intelligence that I was especially interested in was the idea of the Turing test, um, which was named after Alan Turing, who's considered in some ways the father of computers. Um, and he's sort of having his historical moment right now. Um, uh, Thanks to Benedict Cumberbatch. I, I think it's helping, but there've been a lot of. There's strangely been this run of things about right. Turing. Um, there was the 2012 Olympics, because Turing was a was uh, he almost actually ran for England, the UK, right. in the Olympics because he was a great athlete. And there was a push to get his um, conviction. He was convicted for sodomy mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, get his conviction overturned, which they wouldn't do for some reason. Um, and uh, so there's been these movies, and I was writing about it. Some other books came out at that time that were writing about it. So there's, he's kind of having a moment, which is nice. But the Turing test asserts that if a computer can trick you into thinking it is a human 30% of the time in a contest against another human, um, then we'd have to consider it intelligent. It would just be sort of you know, impolite not to. And that's the one I was particularly interested in. So I went into this very sub-world of artificial intelligence, which is about chat bots. And these are the, the, bot, the bots that you chat with, that you talk with. And there's a whole, it's a real sort of garage hobbyist kind of area. You won't find a lot of university money behind this. You won't really find a lot of uh, big tech money behind it. But I, there's a guy named Rich Wallace who programmed, a, he made a language called Artificial Intelligence Markup Language. It's a little like HTML. But you can go in and you can write, you can create this sort of conversation, this computer that can respond to a conversation. They can, it'll see a certain word and give you another feedback. And it's not quite right. You know in three or four responses that it's, you're not talking to a human. And then I found another person who lives in New York who actually hosts a Turing test every year. And I flew out and judged it. And it was really funny. It was, in, it was in his apartment. So this is, you know, you know, this is the level that we're working it's a at. Passionate hobby. Right? Yes, yeah. so it's a passionate hobby. And his, he's not a computer science either. He does okay. like he does brass finials for a living. But he wants artificial intelligence to come around so the so the rest of us can quit work. He he envisions a world in which we don't work and we just devote ourselves to hedonism. That's his goal. So he supports this uh, supports this contest for that. And if you win, you get a big, pick, big brass medal with Alan Turing on the other side and his face on the other, um, you know, Alan Turing on one side and his face on the other side. And when I saw the medal, Alan Turing's face was, you couldn't see it. It was just his face on the outside. Fascinating. Yeah. But I loved that little subculture that I discovered, and that, that does end up in the, in the book. And um, my concern with, with that, uh, the point of view of that subculture is that I have a, filter that I've, my whole life has been like filtered through these movies that I've seen and mm. inevitably you, you got to refer to like Skynet and the Terminator where sure. the, once you hand it over the keys to the machines it does not go well for the human race mm -hmm. um, but I guess some people have a much more optimistic um, opinion that you know we can all be fed you know uh, be uh, pleasured mm -hmm. and, uh, and live a, an easier life um, and let the machines do all the work. Well, 
I mean, it might work. Right. I don't know. I don't know. But you know, artificial intelligence as a field has been overpromising since it was invented. Sure. So the idea that they would have talking computers um, that would pass the Turing test, I mean, they thought that that would happen decades ago. And they are making a lot of advances right now because suddenly there's money in it. Uh, but, but, you know, where are our flying cars? Right. Like I'm waiting for my flying car. Right. Well, we were talking about Blade Runner before exactly. we sat down. And Which was I think, 2019. Yeah, 20, it's just around the corner. And we've got, um, <laughs> in, in, some ways, Los, yeah, in some ways, Los Angeles still looks a lot better than it does in that film. <laughs> but it, in others, like, it would be nice to have those flying cars. Yeah. Um, the, you've got such a, a, a beautifully playful title, um, an emotional title uh, that also has a, a, a technical um, uh, twinge to it. So to, can you tell us about the title and its meaning and, and ultimately, um, you know, the, uh, the, the theory of love that, that, that is expressed in the book? Sure, yeah. So, you know, yeah, the, the title is meant to sort of harness the two sides. The, you know, the novel basically has two stories in it. One is the main character, Neil Bassett Jr.'s, um, the sort of complete meltdown of his private life and his sort of rebuilding his personal life in the way that he does. And the other is uh, the computer that he's working on, the startup he's working on, which, the, which is trying to create the world's first intelligent computer, the, the computer that will pass the Turing test. Now they're using, it just happens, they're using the journals of his dead father. So what Neil is there to do is to help on the phrasing. He ends up, over the course of the novel, in fact, kind of creating his father, creating his ideal father in these conversations. And these conversations reflect back on his personal life, and so it becomes this interchange that he moves through. Um, so it is about love, of, it's about you know, romantic love, it's about love of self, it's about filial love. And it kind of pulls all of those questions in. I wouldn't say at the end, you, you know, you would have, there's, there's no fortune cookie at the end that says, here you go. Uh, but I, you know, hopefully it has weighed a lot of the different um, different questions and, and evaluated the different questions and clarified the field, at least, of you know questions about a theory of love. Uh, so you've been working on you worked on the book for four or five years before publication, mm -hmm. and this is your first published novel. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. You've also published articles for San Francisco Magazine. I have. What are some of the, the uh, magazines? style stories that you've written? Um, well, for San Francisco Magazine, I did an interview with Michael Chabon, the writer. Um, I wrote, I feel like I did another little piece for them. Sometimes I do book reviews for the New York Times. Mm -hmm. and I did, a, um, I, did, I did a little travel writing for Budget Travel for a little while. So I don't have a deep magazine background, but I've done this and that. Chabon's a, an East Bay favorite, obviously. Yeah. And is, Wonderful, most recent novel set right here on Telegraph Avenue, mm -hmm. and titles and titled Telegraph Avenue. What did you and and Shab What was the piece uh, focused on with Shabon? Um, well, I, I I came in with this grand theory. I said, well, I, you know, Michael Shabon is our Charles Dickens, and I wanted to go over there and talk to him about it. But it turns out that Shabon hates Charles Dickens, yeah. and so it didn't go over quite as well as I had imagined. Um, he's much more, more interested in George Eliot, and I guess Telegraph Avenue is kind of his middle march, middle march of the East Bay. But we just talked about his writing and his relationship to California. Um, I was interested in why he doesn't write more about California. You know, he's been living in the East Bay for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And he has one California book, as far as I know. And many, many more books about Pittsburgh, where he went to college. Right. You know, so um, you know, there's, for some reason, that is a fictional territory he returns to a lot, much less so out here. So I just, that was part of what I was looking at. So we such just had, we said breakfast. Such an interesting creative writer though. I mean, he'll take you to an alternate universe in Alaska in one book and then a very, you know, realistic um, university in uh, Wonder Boys, I think is my favorite of his. That's uh, a great book. And, uh, and then uh, a fairy tale book and a Sherlock Holmes uh -huh. revisit. I, I, I love the way he can um, really elevate genre fiction to, to a, to a a whole another level of yeah of he literature. draws on genre in a way that I mean he gets a lot of energy from it it's not it doesn't trap him at all so obviously Shabon a, a guy that's won Pulitzers or a Pulitzer and and um, has received kudos from from um, every literary you know uh, enthusiast um, back to you 
it's, it's always so exciting to talk to somebody who has just published that first book. It's, it's, such a, a, it's such an ordeal and such a passion project to get that first novel um, published. So can you talk about the satisfaction of, of seeing this uh, become a reality? Yeah, I mean, it was, it's uh, deeply satisfying. I mean, I've been, been writing for years, you know, so it's not something I just took up. And I, um, when I first started working on this novel, especially with the conversations with the father, the artificial intelligence conversations, you know, my thinking is, this is ludicrous. No one's going to let me do this. And when I finally put it together and took it out in the world and there was interest in it, it was very, it was honestly a little bit of a surprise. And uh, I, was, I was happy that it, I was happy that it happened, and you know, I, I had a, I had a nice experience getting it published, and it's just, it's wonderful to talk to people who've read it. So when I get a note or something from somebody who's read it, that's, to me, that's the most gratifying part of the whole process. And the, I, w I would imagine, has the guy in New York read the book? The, the guy with the I don't test? know. I don't know. I, ha I, di I didn't send him a copy, so <laughs> maybe, maybe. I would imagine there's some really passionate uh, uh, readers here who are, have a, a, a deep fascination with this material. Mm -hmm. So have it, at book appearances and stuff, have you had, um, you know, long engaged Q and A's? I would imagine that, that, that there's great opportunities to really uh, sort of d dive into this material. There, especially around here. Yeah, yeah there's some pe people will be, bring the background, and they'll think about San Francisco and tech, and I, I did a reading for a tech company, and so we, we ended up the cover. That was a very technical conversation after after the reading. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I also did. I was talking to a book club in um, and uh, not San Carlos, where was it? Atherton, and they and, and this book is is meant to really kind of capture a moment and capture the area, so it has a lot of places and real you know. If if I say Draegers is on this street, Draegers is on that street, you know. So. So they went through and they said, okay, well, we know this shop and we know this shop. And they went through the entire thing and they said, but we couldn't figure out where this quilting store is that their former quilting store, their, their business is. And they were asking me, asking me, I said, I, actually, that's the one part I made up. But they found that, that one detail yeah. that I kind of was hoping nobody would notice. And it's fiction, about. right? You're allowed yeah, to do that, I'm allowed right? to do that, you know. That's great. Um, have you, you've got students at Stanford. Have, have they read the book? Have, uh, I would imagine you didn't make this part of the class assignment, right? It's actually against the rules yeah, I would, at, I would so. at Stanford to teach your own book, unless, you, unless your book does something no other books do, so, uh, which is appropriate. Have you gotten any feedback from students who have gone out of their way to...? Yeah, some, I, some students will read it and they'll talk to me about it. So um, none of them have said anything negative, thankfully. Uh, though I also often get students come in, they say, my mom read your book and she loved it. Interesting. So they, the parents maybe are reading the book more than the students. <laughs> well, that's, that's got to feel good for those parents that are shelling out for Stanford, right. that, like, that they're impressed with the, yeah. what, what the teacher's working on on his own time. Now, we talked about um, the libraries that you use, but what about bookstores? I mean, mm -hmm. it, uh, it's, it's a harder business to find that, like, you said you grew up in a town that didn't have a bookstore. That's right. We're getting to the point where there's cities that don't have a bookstore, um, which is a sad thing because there's a different experience to go to a brick and mortar store and talk to, you know, a very opinionated bookstore mm -hmm. clerk or the same thing with record stores, you know, mm -hmm. to find, to discover literature that way rather than sort of um, clicking on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what bookstores do you uh, appreciate here in the Bay Area? Uh, well, I mean, we have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to independent bookstores, as you know, in the Bay Area. And uh, in San Francisco, you know, I love Booksmith, uh, which is where I did my first reading for this. Uh, there's the Books, Inc. chain I like a lot. City, Light, City Lights Bookstore, I, every time I go, I don't go to North Beach very often, but when I do, I always think, this is a great bookstore. It's open until midnight. It's yeah. a great bookstore. Um, and then... You know, in the East Bay, there's, you know, wow, there's wonderful books all over the place, you know. We have one in Danville nearby here named Rake's Draw Books. Of course. And yeah, yeah. Rake's Draw's wonderful. Michael Barnard, who owns that store, mm -hmm. is just the real deal. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, was, I just did an interview with an actor, a uh, filmmaker named Colin Hanks. He's got a very well-known father. Uh, but he I've seen Colin Hanks on Mad Men. Yeah, he's, priest, and he's right? on uh, Fargo. He's a mm -hmm. great young actor, but he just made this terrific film about... Tower Records, the rise and fall of this, uh, of this record, record store. And, um, and what a great kind of cultural institution Tower Records 
was, but how easy it was for 200 stores to just go away. Mm -hmm. But Colin was saying that, you know, there's always going to be a place for that excellent record store or bookstore that, mm -hmm. you know, but they really got another stuff and they really need to provide that customer service, you know, because um, there aren't many of them left, you know. My understanding is that the past three years, independent bookstores are doing better and better. Well, that's good. That's so that's my, that is my understanding of the numbers, which may have something to do with the collapse of Barnes & Noble. I mean, yeah. I don't know. But, but yeah, I think that the, it seems to me the independent bookstore is, a, is not only viable, but maybe necessary. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think it's so great whenever I get into a new town to find that, you know, that beloved bookstore or mm -hmm. record store. So anyway, it is a real treat to, uh, to hear about your story. It's a really imaginative um, uh, novel and i um, very excited to have you here at the Walnut Creek Library. Thank you for supporting the library and the, and the Authors Gala that we had here a few weeks back. That's a beautiful library, yeah. And uh, best of luck at Stanford and with this novel, and I'm sure we'll be having you back um, to talk about your next book soon. Thanks for having me, Pete. Scott, thank you so much. And uh, thank you at home for watching Get Lit. Um, make sure to tune in uh, regularly. We have all kinds of, of local authors uh, telling their stories and why they love libraries. I'm Pete Crooks. See you next time on Get Lit.